Hello everyone and thank you for coming to hear about my review of Open Pedagogy or OER and Naval Pedagogy research findings. Before going into examples of how pedagogy can be changed with OER, a brief primer on licensing is needed. I won't go into detail as there's likely other presentations during this com conference focusing on this by people much more knowledgeable than me, but basically OER are open because of their licensing. And it's that licensing that makes them freely available. That is, access charges are not, are not an issue. That licensing also means that depending on the details of that licensing, one can change them and use them differently than traditionally copyrighted material, copyrights for commercial materials. I recommend reviewing Creative Commons website for details, but basically, there is a continuum to openness. The key components necessary for substantive pedagogy changes that, that go beyond saving students from money are remixing and sharing. There are five R's to OER that can allow for changes in pedagogy. They are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Generally, you cannot legally do these things to copyrighted materials. And this is why open means so much more than free. A material can be free, but not allow any of the permissions afforded by those five R's I just mentioned. Now, saving students money is important in and of itself and is, has been shown to reduce course withdrawal rates and reduce the financial burden of a college education. But there's so much more that can be done with that Creative Commons, co Creative Commons licensing on opening material. The opportunities afforded by open licensing are practices known as OER-enabled pedagogy. There are many names for OER-enabled pedagogy, including open pedagogy, open educational practices, and depending on the licensing involved, non-disposable or renewable assignments. Across these definitions, which have been reviewed elsewhere, uh, is the idea that these are the teaching and learning practices that are possible due to the affordances of OER licensing. Their characteristics are innovation, creation, collaboration, and participation by both instructors and students. In other words, active learning is involved. Here is a chart to clarify how renewable assignments differ from more traditional assignments. Renewable assignments uh, involve having the students create an artifact that is then openly licensed. So in this way, the student is not only promoting their own learning, but they are creating something that can be used by others and is findable and then can be, uh, those five R's then can uh, relate to that renewable assignment if it's openly licensed. This creates a sustainable OER ecosystem. So if we just had people passively receiving materials, but not taking an active part in creating the materials, we wouldn't have a sustainable ecosystem. Eventually we would run out of creators of materials. So it's essential that we have this cycle continue. So if you're like me, you're probably thinking this all sounds lovely, but I need to see some evidence about what actually happens when we have open pedagogy. Well, you're in luck. I conducted a systematic review of the research <clears throat> on OER-enabled pedagogy. In a systematic review, a thorough and exhaustive search is conducted. To organize what I found, I'll describe first what the commonalities and differences in the concept of open pedagogy across studies was, then go into the research findings on student experiences and faculty experiences. A systematic review is a research study in and of itself, and therefore it has methods. In this case, uh, the studies are data. So studies were included if they use the term open pedagogy or one of the synonyms I mentioned earlier, reported empirical data on either student or faculty experiences and were conducted in the context of a course assignment. Four scholarly databases, 
uh, were searched using key terms. And from that search, 2,554 citations were found and the abstracts and titles were double screened, meaning that at least two researchers screened them. Um, I resolved any conflicts between the, the researchers during the screening process. There was then a backward search of the references of any relevant report to see if there were any studies that were cited that would be eligible, and a forward search as well, in which I looked to see what had cited the relevant reports to see if there had been anything new that came out. This led to a total of 18 eligible reports. Uh, one had separate empirical studies, one for students and one for faculty. So it was a total of 19 studies that were synthesized. Research question one. In most of the studies reviewed, open pedagogy involves students creating novel and useful artifacts that had value beyond learning. In other words, renewable assignments. Most of the studies explicitly indicated that the artifacts would be publicly shared and openly licensed. The affordances of open licensing were also described as crucial for open pedagogy across several studies. Indeed, the description of open pedagogy in several of the studies specifically mentioned open licensing. However, there were variations. In some studies, the focus was on student-created OER in terms of open licensing. In other studies, the focus was on the value of student artifacts beyond the class. Generally, the descriptions and instantiations of open pedagogies in the reviewed studies converged with the concept of OER-enabled pedagogy I mentioned earlier. There were three studies in which they, this was not the case. Um, and in each of those studies, uh, Cronin 2017, Masterman 2016, Pascaviscus and Irvine 2019, the purpose was to explore faculty experiences with teaching open pedagogy. So the focus was more on the faculty rather than what the students actually created. One area in which the studies varied was on whether publicly sharing and openly licensing materials was optional or required. Generally, public sharing and open licensing were optional. There were two studies in which it was explicitly required, Bonica 2018 and Zong and colleagues 2020. In the Bonica 2018 study, students had the option of using a pseudonym rather than their names if they were concerned about privacy. However, Bonica reported that all students opted to use their real names in order to showcase their work to potential employers. Zhang and colleagues had students post on public social media platforms, and they noted that this requirement did not work well for shy students. On to research question number two. What were the research findings for OER-enabled pedagogy in terms of students' experiences? First, the good. The majority of the studies with students focused on perceptions of open pedagogy and its various instantiations. Across studies, students generally perceived open pedagogy as a positive and meaningful learning experience. Students appre expressed appreciation in developing artifacts that could be used by others. This appeared to foster pride in their work, likely because they knew it would be seen and used by others. In addition, students reported feelings of agency as scholars, that they were contributing to a body of knowledge rather than simply consuming what's already known. Students reported better critical thinking skills through open pedagogy than traditional pedagogy in two studies by Hilton and colleagues, 2019 and 2020. This is likely because students had to evaluate sources and synthesize ideas when creating their artifacts, in addition to giving and receiving feedback to their work. Uh, only two studies examined learning outcomes, and they were neither good nor bad. Tillian Haston colleagues 2020, as well as Bloom 2019, compared course sections with students' open pedagogy to students having more traditional assignments. The two approaches to open pedagogy differed in that Tilling Hest and colleagues had students revise an existing OER textbook, and Bloom had students develop OER learning tools. However, their findings regarding student learning outcomes were similar. 
Bloom noted that increases in writing mechanics knowledge appeared to be larger for students in the open pedagogy group, but the difference was only marginally significant. Given the relatively small sample, it's possible that reliable results could be found <coughs> with a larger sample. However, the bad part was that some students did report anxiety related to the project. Um, although it was reported that students had um, some resistance to the change from a more from what they were used to with a more instructor focused approach to a more student centered approach, uh, one colleague one of the studies noted that quote insurgency was rare. So thankfully, even though there were some anxiety issues, it did not result in um, overall student uproar. There was also some anxiety about the public nature of the work. In addition, open pedagogy does not necessarily have to be done digitally, but in, orly, in order to have it publicly and freely shared, it almost certainly involves digital technologies. Uh, dig technology frustrations were noted, as well as some issues with students being uncertain about what they were supposed to do, which is a common common case with any assignment that uh, has broad criteria. However, that's not always the case. Zhang and colleagues noted that students felt quite comfortable with the technology, but in their study, they were having the students use technology that they were already comfortable with. I'm gonna focus in on one study um, in particular by Tillinghouse. And it is focusing on student redesign and remix of OER. This contributes directly to the OER ecosystem by having students improve existing OER and redistribute. Because OER licensing can allow for editing, students can be assigned to redesign and remix OER. Tillinghouse and colleagues have an excellent example of this with a nutrition textbook. In this study, one class had an OER and another class had the OER plus an open pedagogy assignment to conduct a project on health at every size. They found there were similar grades and use between the two sections, OER and OER plus open pedagogy. Students who did the open pedagogy assignment were more critical of the OER, which makes sense because they were tasked with improving the textbook. So of course, if you have students whose job it is to improve the textbook, they're gonna be more critical of it. As you can see by these student quotes though, students found the open pedagogy aspect of the project intellectually challenging and engaging. There were a number of studies in which students created OER, and I'm just gonna show you these to give you an idea of how you could have your students be involved with uh, this key to long-term sustainability of OER. Uh, one study did a research brief on instructional design, learning tools and rhetorical components. Uh, once they had graduate students co-author a textbook, um, another had upper level ad undergraduates and another study had doctoral students creating a research guide. Turning now to faculty experiences. First, when we look at faculty who use OER-enabled pedagogy, the number is a lot large. However, the more faculty use OER, the more likely they are to embrace its possibilities with practice. Personally, this makes sense to me as an instructor. I wasn't even aware of OER enabled pedagogy at first. When I got into OER, I was concerned about the efficacy compared to commercial resources. Now that we know that learning outcomes are equivalent, it's not time to take the next step to embracing the innovative pedagogy that OER allows. Another predictor of using OER, OER enabled pedagogy is just having more student-centered philosophies in general. You know, if you have a very instructor-focused traditional approach to teaching, you're probably not gonna to be too keen on students being creators and having them make materials for others. 
In addition, faculty who use OER-enabled pedagogy report being more motivated to improve and access to knowledge. One area this is important is in ex expanding beyond traditional Western sources of knowledge or to have the information be more regionally relevant. Finally, those who use OER-enabled pedagogy say it promotes collaborative learning and empowers students. Based on analyses of faculty interviews, Cronin identified four dimensions across educators using open educational practices. One is that they valued privacy, but they wanted openness in the virtual learning environment. A second is developing digital literacies in their own professional development, as well as their teaching. A third is social learning and having learners be actively involved in their learning. A fourth is having more porous boundaries between teachers and students so that collaboration and open material co-construction can be possible. The five R's again. So now that we have gone over the five R's of OER, I want to highlight how it's important to follow the five R's of open pedagogy. The five R's of open pedagogy. First, respect. Respect students as creators and be sure to let them have an attribution for their intellectual property. Reciprocate. In this, be part of the open education community yourself. Don't expect your students to contribute something that you do not yourself contribute to. Risk. Realize that public posting may make students vulnerable as the internet is forever. Reach. Reach means that learning is ongoing. It goes beyond a particular class and semester when it's open. And resist. Resist against commercial ideals. The information should be expensive and constrained. Challenge yourself to use open education as a force for social justice. So what can we take for, from this? Well, OER gives us opportunities for innovative teaching. However, as is the case with good teaching in general, we need to be clear about why students are doing it and how they should do it. There is a careful balance here to provide enough room for creativity and choice, but not to overwhelm students to the point of utter confusion. Also, open pedagogy techniques often require new technologies, so be sure to know how to use it as an instructor and make sure that there is support available for students when they inevitably have questions. A general teaching with technology tip I have learned is to test out something in a class by offering to have students explore a tool for extra credit before I start requiring things with real stakes attached to them. If you're interested in learning more about open pedagogy, I encourage you to check out these three blogs at the top. They give some really great advice on how to pursue this. There's also a two articles or one article in a book chapter on open pedagogy and social justice and one has been recently published by Bali and colleagues and is an excellent article I highly recommend the other one is shameless self-promotion it's my book chapter that uh, came out a few months ago if you would like some more how-to guidance on open pedagogy I've curated a list of examples and resources in this Google document. So if you need a faculty guide to open pedagogy that applies across disciplines, by all means, help yourself. It is openly licensed. All right, I look forward to hearing what questions you have during the presentation. And this presentation was based on an article that uh, was published a few months ago in the Journal for Learning for Development. If you scan this, you will get the direct link to the journal, which is open access. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your comments.